Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Danielle Daw, Adult Services Librarian here at the Library, and your host for this evening. This virtual event is part of the Halton Hills Lecture Series, and before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to thank the friends of the Halton Hills Public Library. Their support has made lectures such as this possible. Tonight, we welcome Terry Fallis, the award-winning author of seven national bestsellers. His debut novel, The Best Laid Plans, won the 2008 Stephen Leacock Medal for Humor. It was also crowned the 2011 winner of CBC Canada Reads and was featured as our own 2012 One Book, One Halton Hill selection. His latest novel, Albatross, was released last summer and quickly entered the national bestsellers list. Terry joins us tonight to discuss Albatross, his writing process, and have a brief Q&A with us. Now, without further ado, please welcome Terry Fallis. And Terry, I hand it off to you. Hello, everyone. And Danielle, thank you for those kind words. And it's nice to be back with uh, the halt at Halton Hills. I remember my visits there in the past. And this one is not quite the same as being there, but uh, uh, it's better than not being here at all. So uh, delighted to, to be with you all uh, tonight. Let me just uh, share my screen and put my uh, my uh, presentation up on uh, the uh, wall here. Sorry, one second. And share. There, hope you, everyone can see that now. I thought I'd tell you a little bit about this novel that came out last August. It's called Albatross. Uh, if you have heard me speak before, you may know that I'm a member in good standing of the Write What You Know School of Writing. Uh, you can find pieces of me and pieces of my life strewn about uh, the pages of my novels. Uh, not in an autobiographical way, but I just find it easier to write with authenticity and uh, you know, conviction and authority if I'm writing about something that I've experienced before or that I care about or that I know something about. And that's certainly the case uh, in this novel. So I'm going to give you now my novel in a nutshell. Uh, yes, I know that's quite lame. But uh, anyway, there it is. So there's a lot going on in this novel. There is a, a young wannabe writer uh, we'll introduce to him to him more formally in a minute or two. His aging phys ed teacher plays a role in this novel. There's an obscure Swedish kinesiologist and his equally obscure Swedish kinesiology theory. Uh, there is a measuring tape. There is a love story and what I call an antiphonal novel. If there are any choristers who are watching tonight, uh, you may know the word antiphonal. When I was in the choir growing up at, at church, uh, we used to sing on occasion what we called antiphonal anthems, where half the choir would be on one side of the church and the other half would be on the other side of the church, and we would sing back and forth to one another. That's what antiphonal means, back and forth. So I changed that a little bit, and in this, uh, in this novel, uh, the narrator and his girlfriend are writing an antiphonal novel where he writes one chapter and then she writes the next and they write back and forth to one another. And they're telling the story of a, of a young relationship uh, in, a, in a different time, many, many years before the novel is set. But it doesn't take long for you to realize that they are in fact writing about their own relationship, but doing it through the characters in this novel, they're writing to one another. <clears throat> anyway, there is a story of friendship and then, of course, so that you're totally comfortable and, and familiar with uh, feeling in, so on solid ground, I've thrown in all those familiar tropes that come with comic novels like golf, fountain pens, Lake Tomogamy, the Burj Al Arab Hotel, the paparazzi, and of course, a black bear. So you should be feeling quite uh, at home, I hope, with this novel. Maybe to start, I should explain why the novel is called Albatross. And I should tell you that until maybe eight weeks before it went to press, it wasn't called Albatross. I wrote the entire novel, did the entire editing process back and forth, proofread all the galleys, everything was all done. It was ready to go to print. And my editor called me and said, about the title. And it seemed that I was the only one who seemed to like the title I had come up with originally for the novel. And it was called, If at First You Succeed. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's a clever little play on words, but apparently not clever enough. So uh, 
the my editor said, "What else have you got?" And I said, "Nothing, but give me a, an hour, and I'll come back with something." And 45 minutes later, I emailed her the single word "albatross" as a proposed title, and then I explained why I thought that would work. And there are a few meanings of albatross, but there are at least two at play in this novel. First of all, there is the famous Samuel Taylor Coleridge epic poem uh, called The Rime of the Ancient Mariner. And one of the stanzas there uh, reads, Ah, well a day, what evil looks had I from old and young. Instead of the cross, the albatross about my neck was hung. And this is the poem that gives us the famous uh, meaning for albatross, the burden around my neck, the burden I must bear. Uh, and that's where it comes from, from that poem. Uh, and the story is that a, a sailor on this captain's ship in the middle of the ocean, uh, an albatross flew too close to the ship and he managed to take a swing at it with something and he killed it. And the captain was so incensed with this, uh, this sort of senseless killing that he made the uh, sailor as penance carry the albatross around his neck for the next several days. Uh, and that was the burden he must bear. So in this novel, uh, there is a, a cross or a burden that the narrator must bear, and we'll come back to that. Second of all, this novel has a bit of golf in it. And in golf, if you are a true student of the game, you may know that albatross is, is sort of now an out of fashion term, but it means a score of three strokes under par on a hole. So if Danielle is playing golf and she gets her second shot in the hole on a par five, she has scored the elusive albatross. So both of these definitions come to play in this novel. So that's why albatross ended up being the name. And I sent the, the suggestion in and 20 minutes later, uh, my editor called back and said, okay, I've run it around the, the publishing company here, McClellan and Stewart, uh, and everyone loves it. The, the novel is now called Albatross. And that's what happened. So let me introduce you to some of the characters here. <clears throat> the narrator of the novel is a young man named Adam Coriel. Uh, he's 17 years old when the novel opens. He's starting his last year in high school. Uh, he is not an athlete by any sense of the word. He doesn't like sports that much. He really only loves three things, other than his family, of course. He loves fountain pens. Uh, he has always loved fountain pens, and he has a small collection, uh, and he writes with fountain pens. He loves literature and creative writing. Uh, in fact, he really only wants to be a writer. In his life, it's all he, he dreams about is becoming a writer, a novelist. And he's not a naturally gifted writer. He's very good, but he's not naturally blessed with talent. So his success as a writer turns on effort and hard work, and he's putting it in and getting better. Uh, finally, he loves his girlfriend, Allison. Uh, so th here's a young man and is on the cusp of his final year of, in high school, uh, just wants to be a writer. Uh, and these photographs <laughs> aren't really accurate depictions. I just lifted some photos from the, uh, the internet, <laughs> but they represent the character, shall we say. Uh, his phys ed teacher is Bobby Davenport, Roberta Davenport. She's in her late 50s. Uh, she's new to the school. Her career as a teacher is winding down. Uh, she was born and raised in the small town of Thessalon, Ontario, uh, on the way up north of Superior. Uh, and uh, she grew up in that small town. Her parents owned a motel right on the shores of the lake. Her parents. She didn't have a great upbringing. Her parents, I think, fought a lot. Uh, I say I think because I don't really explain why it was kind of rough uh, for her growing up. But what it meant is when she was a kid and home from uh, and you know at home during the summers, uh, she would get on her bike and at the, in the morning and ride her bike all day so she didn't have to be around the uh, the motel. And one day she was out on her bike riding. She was probably nine or 10 at the time. And she sees a strange vehicle drive by. Uh, and it turned out it was the mobile library from Sault Ste. Marie. And she's interested in what this 
you know, colorfully painted uh, bus is with the character in the back, a book with arms and legs waving at her. Uh, so she races her bike into, uh, into downtown Thessalon and the, the bookmobile has parked in the town square, the, the sort of city hall area. And she climbs on board and a very enthusiastic librarian, probably not unlike Danielle, uh, encouraged her to, to start reading more and helped her choose some books that would take her to faraway places and to faraway times. And Bobby Davenport's life changed in an instant. She became an avid reader and books became her great escape and her great love. And they stayed with her for uh, her entire life. In fact, it led her to, uh, to, to teaching, and she's a phys ed teacher, but she also teaches the writer's craft class, largely because of her love for writing. Uh, she also loves fountain pens. What a coincidence to have two people, a student and a class and a teacher, both who love fountain pens, but uh, there you go, it happens. Finally, Bobby Davenport was an excellent golfer. She was a club champion at the Toronto Ladies Golf Club in Toronto, which is a real place, a wonderful uh, club. Uh, I've played it many times. Uh, she was club champion, got a full ride scholarship to Stanford University, uh, and was just about to join the LPGA Tour, the professional golf tour, when her back gave out on her and her dream was shattered. Uh, she swung with such ferocity that her back simply couldn't take it. So she never joined the tour. She became a teacher instead, uh, and she had to give up her dream. Uh, the third character I should introduce you to is Alison Clarkson, Allie. This is the, uh, the love interest in the novel, I guess you could say. Adam uh, met Allie on the first day of school the previous year, in their grade 11 year. Uh, and he sat next to her and was kind of entranced by her, her appearance. She's a lovely uh, young woman, uh, but he really loved that she was writing with a fountain pen, a Lamy Safari fountain pen. So lo and behold, there are three people in this story who like fountain pens. And she was writing in a, with a rather uh, popular ink. It was diamine ancient copper and recognizable on the page to any fountain pen enthusiast. And at one point during the class, uh, Adam is looking over uh, at the work she's doing and she thought he was copying her and she tried to cover it up and he said, no, no. And he pointed to the ink and then he reached into his backpack and he pulls out a bottle of diamine ancient copper ink and the bond is formed, forged right there in that instant. And they became fast friends and then uh, romantically involved. Uh, she is also a lover of literature and writing, but she is naturally gifted as a writer. She has a real future uh, in creative writing. So they bond over uh, their love for fountain pens and creative writing. Finally, I should introduce you to Professor Ingmar Gunnarsson. Uh, he is an obscure Swedish kinesiologist, uh, and he has developed a theory, which I'll tell you about, uh, I hope, in not excruciating detail in a minute. Uh, but Dr. Gunnarsson was a great character to write because he has no filter. Whatever he thinks, he says. And this has caused him no end of problems. Uh, and in fact, it caused him so many problems that he's been banished from his beloved university in, in Stockholm, and he is now uh, teaching and doing research at the University of Adelaide in Australia. So if he thinks it, he says it. And uh, comic novelists like to write characters who have no filter because there's lots of opportunity for mayhem and, and humor. So his, uh, his theory involves a measuring tape and Bobby Davenport is reading about uh, this theory in a journal, the Swedish Scandinavian Journal of Kinesiology, I think it was called in the novel. And her homeroom class that Adam is a part of are filling out their insurance forms at this time on the first day of school. Uh, the liability forms so that the parent, parents won't sue the school if one of them gets hit in the head with a baseball or bounces off the trampoline and, all, <laughs> and hurts themselves. So while they're filling it out, she's reading this article, and it's fascinating. Uh, 
And it's rooted in the belief that everybody has a body that should be able to excel at at least one sport or another. And Professor Gunnarsson takes on this theory and develops it. And the first sentence in the novel uh, is Bobby Davenport saying to a few of her young class uh, students in her boys phys ed class, would you mind if I measured your extremities? And that's what really kicks off the novel. This theory of Professor Gunnarsson involves, and the theory is called the proactive, sorry, the predictive innate pinnacle proficiency theory. I should know the name of the theory, I invented it. Uh, and it involves a series of bodily measurements. And you take all these measurements, you plug these measurements into an algorithm and some ratios of these measurements, and the algorithm spits out what we call the Gunnarsson number out of 100. And he has researched all these sports by, uh, by researching the bodies of top athletes, gold medalists, world champions, uh, the best in the world. And he has assessed the different body types that will work for different sports. And then by your measurements, he can tell you at least what sports you should be good at. So the, big, the best players in the world, the world champions, the Tiger Woods, the LeBron James, the Michael Phelps, score about 85 out of 100, 89 maybe out of 100. Uh, that's the Gunnarsson number. Uh, you'd think they would be even higher than that, but no, this is, this is his theory. Uh, there's that group that score in the 89 to, to 100 that are so good they're just naturally gifted in that particular sport that they don't even have to practice because practice is not natural at all. You want to rely on your natural uh, body uh, attributes. And that means just emptying your head and letting your body tell you what you have to do. So young Adam is measured and uh, bearing in mind that nobody in the world has ever got a Gunnarsson score in any sport higher than 89. She measures his, his, uh, uh, his extremities, his measurements, puts it in, in the algorithm, and out pops 99 for golf. No one in the world has ever scored 99 in, in any sport, according to this theory. And here's Adam, scores 99 in golf. Has Adam ever picked up a golf club in his life? Never. Does he have an interest in golf? No, not really. Does he think it's kind of silly hitting a small little ball into a small hole uh, and doing that 18 times over, over the course of about four hours? He thinks it's a ridiculous idea. But he's also interested in whether or not this theory works. So Bobby Davenport takes young Adam to the driving range at her golf club, the Toronto Ladies Golf Club, and lo and behold, he has a swing that looks a lot like Ricky Fowler's swing. And Ricky Fowler is one of the best golfers on the PGA Tour. And, he, and Adam hits a golf ball further and straighter than anyone she has ever seen, even though it was his fourth time swinging a club, his fourth swing of a club. He hits a, a nine iron, 175 yards. So what this proves to Bobby is that, well, that Professor Gunnarsson was right, and this theory holds water. And that's what really kicks off this story. Uh, let's just mention some of the settings in the novel. Uh, the novel is, opens in Toronto, and uh, it's set in Leaside High School. Uh, and that's the Toronto Ladies Golf Club in the bottom left corner there. That's the novel takes place partly there. We go to Stanford University. Adam, in quick succession, in quick order, becomes the very finest young golfer in Canada. Uh, and just like his uh, coach, Bobby Davenport, uh, he earns a full ride scholarship to Stanford where he studies creative writing. He's much more interesting, interested in his writing courses than he is in golf courses, but he does lead the uh, Stanford team to the NCAA championships. All of this happens sort of early on in the novel, so I'm not giving much away here. I'm just getting it set up. We do visit uh, Augusta National for the Masters. We also visit the uh, Tokyo golf course, uh, where the Olympics, at least in this novel, 
are held this coming summer in 2020. Finally, there is a very important scene set atop the Burj Al Arab Hotel in Dubai. And there's a, uh, a scene set in Lake Tomogamy, a few scenes set in Lake Tomogamy. Uh, so you may be forgiven for thinking that this is a novel about golf. In my mind, this is not a novel about golf. It's a novel about life, about love, about grief, but I think most importantly, it's a novel about success and happiness and the tension that so often exists between the two. We often work so hard to be successful at something, our jobs, uh, for instance, and when we get there and we get promoted and we get raises and by all standard measures of success, we are doing very well, but we realize it's not the same as happiness. I think we often confuse success and happiness. And I wanted to explore that, uh, that tension between those two commodities for which we strive in life. So I've created this perfect scenario where we have Adam, all he wants to be is a, is a writer, a novelist, but it turns out he's one of the best golfers in the world, maybe the best golfer in the world, uh, which he doesn't love, but it's hard to turn down the wealth, the riches that come with being the best golfer in the world. So I create this conflict and then, you know, in a way it's why the, uh, it's a gilded cage on the front cover of the novel. Uh, Adam stumbles into the gilded cage very early in the story and then spends the rest of the novel trying to get himself out of the gilded cage and the gilded cage representing his life as one of the best golfers in the world. So I'm always interested in why authors write the novels they do. So I thought I would share with you the connections of this novel with uh, my own life. So this novel is set in Toronto, uh, at least for a good chunk of it, and in Leaside, Leaside High School. Why? Well, this is an easy one. I grew up in Toronto, and guess which high school I went to? Correct, Leaside. Why would I write a story about East York Collegiate when I didn't go there? So I, part of it is trying to avoid the need for research. I know about Leaside High School because I uh, spent five years there. So why golf? Uh, why is this a novel about golf? I, frankly, I could have chosen any sport to write about, but golf being an individual sport probably lent itself to this, uh, this story. Uh, and I've golfed for many years, for a good chunk of my life. Uh, here I am in 2019, lining up a shot. As you can tell from that photo, if you've played golf before, I'm not in the fairway. Uh, I'm in the rough on the right side. The fairway's behind the trees there. Uh, so I'm not a golfer like Adam is, but uh, I aspire one day to be better than I am. But I've played it for a long time. This goes all the way back. Uh, I started playing when I was in grade eight, when I took it uh, in school, grade eight boys golf. So here I am in 1977. I guess I'm 17 years old there, back when I was thinner and my hair was thicker. And also back when gray sweat socks, blue short shorts, and plastic visors were all the rage. I was on the leading edge of golf fashion back then. And yes, I really was that skinny one day. I kind of miss those days. So um, I've played a lot of golf. My twin brother, Tim, and our brother-in-law, Tony, and I do an annual golf pilgrimage down to Virginia. Uh, we end up playing, uh, you know, driving 12 hours at, starting at three o'clock in the morning and playing golf that afternoon at the Luray Caverns Golf and Country Club in Luray, Virginia, a very small town where there really isn't anything except a movie theater and this golf course. But it is the site of my uh, greatest golf achievement. Uh, I think it was back in 2003, I somehow managed to score 79. So I broke 80, the one time in my golfing career that I have broken 80. Uh, I wish I had the actual scorecard tattered as it is to show you, uh, but I couldn't get to the bank early enough today to get to my safety deposit box. Okay, I'm kidding about that. But uh, anyway, uh, that's why it's about golf. I've played a lot of golf. I know a lot about golf. No research was required to me to, for me to write the golf scenes. So why Lake Tomogamy? There is a couple of scenes uh, about Lake Tomogamy set there. Well, when I was growing up uh, as a kid, 
Uh, my twin brother Tim and I spent the first 16 summers of our lives on a 20 acre island in the remote southwest arm of Lake Tomogamy. We were at Camp White Bear. Our first summer at Camp White Bear, we were 18 months old. Now I know what you're thinking. What kind of camp is this that takes 18 month old campers? Well, that's not quite how it unfolded. My father was camp doctor for the first six years of our lives. So we would spend our, those first six years, six summers up there as offspring of the doctor. Uh, but then we went as fully fledged campers and right up to when I was a, a staff member as a, as a tripper there. So I know a lot about that beautiful lake. Uh, it's an extraordinary place. Uh, it's an Ojibwe word that means deep water. And at some points in the lake, it can get up to 600 feet deep. Uh, it's a very uh, special place. Uh, so my brother and I still go back there. We took my father, who passed away a, about a year ago now. Uh, but we, uh, we took him back to the island a couple of times. The camp folded when we were 16. Uh, and uh, many of the people who went to the camp and worked there bought the island and now have cottages on it. So we still go back. Uh, in the novel, there's a scene where Adam is by himself at a, at a campsite and he is paddling his canoe just before breakfast, just to sort of take a tour of the area around the campsite. And he sees a loon and the water's very calm. The mist is rising off the lake. And he did what we all do when we see a loon. We wait for the loon to dive. And eventually the loon ducked and then Adam cast his eye across the lake to see where it might emerge, where it might come up again, where it might surface. And while he's looking around, this torpedo shoots down the length of the canoe from bow to stern about eight inches below the water. It's moving so quickly past the canoe under the water that there are bubbles coming off its webbed feet. And this was an extraordinary sight for Adam. And he sort of remarks on it and a special experience for him. That's in the novel because the same thing happened to me when I was about 15 on Lake Tomogamy. Uh, and when you see a loon shoot by you underwater at a speed you find hard to believe, you remember that feeling and that image and that vision. Uh, and so when you have experiences like that, you put them in the novel that I gave this experience to Adam, along with an encounter with a bear. I had many bear encounters in Lake Tomogamy, uh, and not unlike the ones you are seeing uh, on the screen now. Uh, so a bit of comic relief, uh, had lots of fun with bears when I was in Tomogamy. So why are fountain pens in this novel? Well, no research was required on my part about the fountain pens. You see, I too am a fountain pen aficionado. Uh, here is the, I guess, the current state of my collection, I guess you could say. Uh, and I don't collect them just for the sake of collecting something. I collect them because to me, fountain pens give me a tangible link to the writers I love and re have read and revere uh, from the past. Uh, so I know that when I'm writing with my Parker Duofold Centennial fountain pen, that it feels the same on the paper as that very pen felt, uh, well, that model of pen felt in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's hand on the page when he wrote the Sherlock Holmes stories uh, so many years, more than a century ago. Uh, Hemingway wrote with a fountain pen. I have a, a, a Ernest, an Ernest Hemingway Montegrappa fountain pen in my collection. It feels the same to write with it as it would to Hemingway back in the day. So I like that tangible link to my, my life as a writer and uh, the lives of the writers I, I look up to. So there is an important scene, a critical scene that takes place uh, at the Burj Al Arab Hotel in Dubai. So why is Dubai in this novel at all? Well, I somehow was invited by the Emir of Sharjah and no, he doesn't know me from a hole in the ground. I think a list was sent to him of Canadian writers. He invited to participate in the Sharjah International Book Fair. I think this was in 20, I want to say 2016, something, 2017 maybe. And I got to spend a week in Dubai participating in this festival. It was uh, lots of fun. 
uh, this is the hotel we stayed in. Uh, I spoke uh, at a workshop. I spoke at the American University in Sharjah. Uh, and this is my, they called her my handler, a uh, person who was a lovely woman who ex escorted me around to make sure I didn't get into any trouble. But uh, the scene in the novel takes place on the helipad of the Burj Al Arab Hotel. And as part of a promotion for Nike, Adam is hitting golf balls off the uh, top of this uh, hotel, the second tallest hotel in the world, I think. And he's hitting golf balls into the uh, Arabian Sea. And it's being videotaped and uh, it's gonna be a promotion, a promotional video and social media content. And you're wondering, where did I come up with this idea of hitting golf balls off the top of this tall hotel? Well, I remember growing up, my brother and I, when we were probably 12, we were given a copy of the Guinness Book of World Records uh, for Christmas. And I think I went through that book so often, I memorized every page. And I remembered uh, a photograph in that book. All these years later, I remember a photograph. And it was this photograph. I found it on the internet in about 10 minutes. Uh, it's a photo of Tony Jacqueline, a famous British golfer, who was hitting golf balls from one side of the Thames River to the other to earn his spot in the Guinness Book of World Records. I remembered that, uh, that photograph, and I just updated the concept of hitting golf balls off a very high place, and that's why that's in the novel. Uh, that, that's a pivotal scene uh, in the story, uh, and so I wanted it to you know, to have some roots in my own experience. Uh, why John Irving? And you're wondering, what are you talking about, John Irving? What does he have to do with the novel? Well, early on in the novel, Adam and his girlfriend, uh, Allison, uh, they take the subway in Toronto down to Harborfront to see one of their favorite authors, John Irving, um, uh, read from his then new novel. Um, and I chose John Irving because he is probably, uh, he's at least in my top two or three writers. I've learned so much from reading John Irving's novels. My favorite novel was uh, A Prayer for Owen Meany. And if any of you have uh, read it, you'll know what I mean. Those of you who haven't, I uh, strongly encourage you to, to read it. And I just, I mention Irving in this talk because and it wasn't in the talk when I started giving it, but when the Toronto Star reviewed Albatross, this is such a small little scene at the beginning of the novel, and yet the headline on their review of Albatross, which was a very positive review, I was very happy about that, but it, you know, the headline was, Hero Just Wants to Write Like John Irving. I just thought it was a strange headline to pick when this novel, or this scene is short and quite inconsequential. <clears throat> so, Anyway, uh, I threw it in. Uh, why don't uh, I read you a bit of the novel? I'll read you the first half of the novel. Okay, no, I'm kidding. I won't do that. Uh, I'm, I'm going to read you uh, just a, about a five-minute section just to give you a flavor for the characters and how the, the narrative flows. So in this scene, Adam is with Bobby Davenport. They're on the golf course. It's his first time playing on a golf course, his very first time. And he's much more excited about driving the golf cart than he is about playing golf. But this is a bit from his first time on the golf course. We carried on. I shot. We talked. I drove. She shouted. I slowed down. We talked and I shot. Playing a round of golf sure eats up, eats up a lot of time. It took hours, maybe three or four. I thought I was doing quite well. At golf, I mean, not at golf, at, sorry, at golf, I mean, not so much at cart driving, but I really didn't know enough about the game to be certain. Ms. Davenport was encouraging and very helpful, but other than on my opening shot, she wasn't exactly doing handsprings and hurling superlatives whenever I finished a hole. Maybe she was a little jittery from my driving. But honestly, there were only a couple of close calls, and she wasn't even in the cart for one of them. We finished the 18th hole, and after handing the rental clubs back, we had a drink on the patio. Ms. Davenport looked a little shaky, even stunned. I was a little concerned. She downed her Arnold Palmer, 
iced tea and lemonade in two big gulps. Uh, are you okay, Miss Davenport? No, no, I can't say I am, she replied, shaking her head. This is absolutely shocking, and I suspect it has never happened in the long and rich history of the game. Well, I already apologized. I swear I thought I had steered clear of that garbage can. And how was I to know the pond was right behind? My view was completely blocked. It was an accident. Mr. Coriel, I'm not referring to your sudden and unauthorized immersion in the water hazard. The golf cart will dry out. Eventually. I'm talking about your golf game. Oh, okay then. But I do feel kind of bad about the whole driving the cart into the pond thing. She consulted the scorecard. Well, you finished with a 74, which for men is four over par on this course. Well, that's a little disappointing. Aren't you supposed to make it around in par? Mr. Coriel, only a microscopic slice of recreational golfers ever, ever shoot par. And even those who do have played the game for years. It's quite possible you are the one and only first time golfer ever to have shot four over par on an 18 hole championship course. Heck, most golfers in their early rounds shoot four over par on every blessed one of those 18 holes. Oh, so I did okay. Okay, Adam, if I may call you by your given name, if Sports Illustrated happened to have had a reporter on the course today, you'd be in next month's magazine, possibly on the cover. Cool, I guess I'd be one of the few non-athletes to appear in those pages. I mean, except for the swimsuit issue. She ignored me and studied the scorecard, which featured not just numbers, but notes as well. Finally, she spoke again. So listen up, that was a great first round. In fact, it was astounding. What's even more impressive, however, is that you achieved that 74 with nine three-putt greens. If you could turn each of those nine three-putt greens into two-putt greens, you would have shot a 65 and would be a PGA caliber player. Holy shuddering shite, that makes my mind a maelstrom. Pardon my language. I got a few of those little birdie thingamajigs too, didn't I? You surely did. Six of them, in fact. Well, I guess that's pretty good. Listen, Mr. Coriel, I'd really like you to play on the high school golf team. I only had one player show up and he promptly sprained his wrist at football practice and is out. If I can get you registered for the tournament next week, will you play? She seemed very excited. I'd forgotten there was a golf team. Well, will you be there so I know what I'm doing? Well, I'll be there, but I can't coach you during the tournament. It's not allowed. I felt a slight twinge of panic. This was getting a little out of hand. What about my writing? What about Allie? I already had a lot on my plate. I'm not sure, Ms. Davenport. Can I think about it? You get the whole day off school, Adam. Okay, I thought about it. I'm in, I replied after deep deliberation. So I get to take a cart all by myself? Uh, no. You walk and carry your own bag in tournaments. Wait, I have to walk the whole course carrying that heavy bag? I'm afraid so. That's how tournaments work. And did I mention the day off? Okay, I'll walk. Splendid. I'll try to make the arrangements. Everything moved quickly after that. One minute I was just a regular student with a girlfriend stressing about my grades as I navigated my last year of high school. The next, I apparently had boundless potential as a golfer and was wearing my school colors in a tournament. I was having a hard time keeping up. It was like being swept along on the crest of a massive wave. If I windmilled my arms, I could just keep my head above the foamy, swirling water. Let me stop there, just close this up and we'll open the floor for questions. Um, for those of you who are interested in the audio book, uh, I actually recorded the audio book for McClellan and Stewart. It's the first time I've ever done that. Uh, in the past, for my first six novels, I actually recorded myself the audio version and released it as a free podcast on iTunes. So uh, you can actually still go to iTunes right now and download all six of my first novels, uh, the audio version of them. Uh, but Albatross, I'm afraid you have to pay for that one. That's the first official audio book I've had. But it was fun working with the producer and, and doing the recording. So I think I've probably taxed your time quite a bit already. Uh, why don't we uh, stop sharing the screen and we can come back and answer some questions. <clears throat> 
All right. Thank you very much, Terry. All Pleasure. Right. Keep you on screen for now so everyone can see you. But yes, we have had some questions come in from the audience. So why don't we get started with one that came in about trust, since that's what we've been talking about. <clears throat> The question was, uh, what inspired you to come up with the study by the Swedish scientist? Ah, uh, well, yes. Uh, well, it was an idea I've had since I was a little kid because I was very into sports. I still am into sports. Uh, but I was, as you saw from that early golf picture, I was really skinny. My twin brother, Tim, and I were, we were so skinny. Uh, so we weren't playing football. Uh, and we, I kept trying to find the sport in which I could really excel. And I just thought, surely my body's built for something. Uh, and, you know, I never didn't pursue it any further than that. But I did experiment with a lot of sports. Uh, and I still play a lot of, well, not a lot of golf, but I play golf when I can. I still play hockey once a week. And I play competitive badminton. So there's a lot, to, a lot going on. Uh, but uh, that's where it came from, this idea that, well, surely somebody could understand the different sports and then look at bodies and figure out which kind of body would excel in that sport. Uh, and that's really where it came from. I just tried to give it enough scientific substance to make it sound plausible. And uh, I've had a few people email me and say, yes, I'm trying to do some more research on that theory, but I can't find it anywhere on online. Can you give me some more information about it, thinking that it was actually a real thing? So I guess that's a good sign that maybe uh, I was able to hoodwink a few people with that. But it's just something I made up as a as a spine for this story. Well, I say it's definitely successful if uh, people think it's got real scientific. Yeah. So <laughs> that was a success, obviously. Yeah. Um, I happen to know, because I was speaking to quite a few of our library patrons before tonight, um, that we have some people watching who aren't actually that familiar um, with your work, but wanted to learn more. So could you maybe discuss briefly just how you got started with writing? Sure, uh, and I'll try to keep it short because I can talk all day about this. Uh, <clears throat> um, I wrote my first novel when I was 45. I came to writing quite late in life. Uh, I just, it was a goal I had set for myself when I was much younger and, and then life happens and jobs happen and you, a marriage and a career and kids happen. And it wasn't until I was, uh, you know, further along than most writers are when I wrote my first novel and it was called The Best Laid Plans. And I just thought I should write about something that I knew about. And my early, the early part of my career was spent in politics. And The Best Laid Plans is a satirical novel about Canadian politics. Uh, and sort of as narrated by someone in the back rooms on Parliament Hill. And I wrote this novel, uh, and I knew enough about the subject because I'd lived that life, uh, that I just thought it would feel authentic and be real. But nobody in their right mind, if they knew anything about the publishing world, would propose a novel about Canadian politics uh, in, in the hopes that publishers might one day publish it. And so uh, very few people were interested in, in it. Uh, I was greeted with a deafening silence when I sent it around to publishers and literary agents. Uh, I could find neither after a year of trying. So I decided to self-publish the novel and I podcast it chapter by chapter as a way to build an audience for it. And to cut this to the, you know, the high point in the story, um, what changed my life as a writer was when the only 10 copies I had of the novel, uh, I sent them in to the Stephen Leacock Memorial Medal for Humor, one of our oldest literary awards in this country, just on a lark, just so that I'd have 10 more readers. And Miracle of Miracles, several months later, The Best Laid Plans, as a self-published novel, won the 2008 Leacock Medal. And my life as a writer changed in an instant. Uh, the day after being shortlisted for the Leacock Medal, I landed a literary agent that I've been trying to find for the preceding two years. Uh, within a week of, of winning, we signed with McClellan and Stewart, where I have been ever since for all of my novels, and they'll be publishing my eighth novel coming up uh, sometime in 2021. So I had a sort of unorthodox beginning to my life as a writer, but I feel like I've exhausted my lifetime allocation of good fortune. Uh, I feel very blessed to have uh, 
sort of been able to somehow win that award that that seemed to put me uh, on the map and, and help get my career started as a writer. Was that, was, do you want me to, I can go on, but that, and well, I think that's, you know, it's a good summary. That, yeah, okay, and, and there are six novels that followed her, and now working on the eighth, so. And of those seven novels and the eighth one following, um, is there one in particular that you would recommend to new readers? Ah, well, that's a very good question. Um, I have a soft spot in my heart for the first one. Um, uh, and I hesitate to say this, I'm not sure it's my best one. Uh, I mean, I didn't really know what I was doing. When I read it now, there are things about it I would probably change. Uh, I think my favorite novel, the story for which I have the greatest affection, is probably my third novel, Up and Down. Uh, and it's, I think it's quite uh, accessible. It's not about politics. Uh, uh, although even if you don't like politics, you know, the best laid plans, uh, I think you would enjoy that as well, but up and down may be a good place to start. And I will mention for everyone watching that, uh, a lot of your older works are available through the library, uh, as ebook right now. Um, so if anyone is, is interested in getting started with any of Terry Fallis' work, um, please head over to Hoopla or Cloud Library and take a look. Now we did have some questions come in about your writing process and you alluded a bit to the challenge with coming up with titles, but is there anything else in your writing process that uh, is a bit challenging for you? Well, I have sort of a, a, a maybe a different process than, than most writers. I'm an engineer by academic training. Uh, I have a degree in mechanical in mechanical engineering. I'd never practiced as an engineer, but uh, I went straight into politics. But I think very much like an engineer. And engineers don't build bridges without blueprints, and I don't write a novel without a blueprint. So I am very much a detailed outliner. Um, if it takes me 14 months to, or 18 months to write a novel, I'm not writing complete sentences until the last four months of that time, generally. Uh, I, I map the whole story out. I have a chapter map and then a char character sketches and settings described. And then I do a full blown chapter by chapter outline, four or five pages of bullet points for each chapter. So I wind up with a, anywhere from a 50 to a 90 page chapter by chapter bullet point version of the novel, all before I've written the first word in the manuscript. However, when I do all that work and that's all behind me, it doesn't take me long to write the manuscript. In fact, in this time of, of social uh, isolation, <laughs> self-isolation, uh, I've had a bit more time to write and I've written uh, so far, 13, 14, 14 chapters of the 15 chapter manuscript of my next novel in about five weeks. Uh, now, there's a lot of work to be done editing and polishing after that, but when I get to that point where I can write the manuscript, I'm guided by my outline and I is just a sprint at that stage. And I take great delight in just crafting the sentences that will bring this story to life. So for me, the hard part is is mapping out the story in a way that feels coherent and that I stay with the outline, outline long enough to finish it, to, to do it, give it its justice uh, so that the writing of the manuscript runs really smoothly, so. <clears throat> and actually that was one of the questions that was sent in. Um, somebody was wondering how many unpublished or half finished books do you have? Ah, well, um, I hesitate to, to say this, but I don't have any. Um, I was so lucky on my first one out. The Best Laid Plans was the first thing I, uh, I had, had ever written of any length. I'd written a handful of short stories before, just recreationally, never sent anywhere. But The Best Laid Plans is the first novel I've ever written. So I don't, I don't have any half-written novels or abandoned novels in my drawer. I suppose that's quite possible in the future, but I don't have any now. <laughs> uh, and I feel quite lucky uh, about that. Well, that's excellent. Yeah, hopefully there's still lots of ideas floating around that <laughs> on page yet. I hope so. <laughs> um, one of the other questions sent in 
Uh, what work are you most proud of? Hmm. Other than uh, our two children, that's what parents are always supposed to say, right? Um, you know, it's hard for me to to pick and choose one of the novels as uh, the one of which I am proudest. Obviously, The Best Laid Plans was a novel that changed uh, my life. So I'm, I'm very proud of uh, th that I was able to write it and that against the obstacles that face almost every uh, rookie writer in this country or any other country, that somehow uh, we managed to get the novel to somebody's attention and, and it became, uh, you know, and, and it did very well. Uh, I mean, that's the novel that keeps on giving. It became a six-part television miniseries for CBC. It became a stage musical out in Vancouver. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm very proud of that, but I, I recognize that there's a lot of serendipity in, in how that all happened. Uh, so I'm proud of them all, but that first one, None of the others would have happened if would have been written if the first one had not uh, broken through. Mm -hmm. Yes. And actually, we did have a couple questions come in about the best laid plans. Um, one of which was, what was the experience like of having that book turned into a TV series and a, a stage play? Oh, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, I, I was just so honored that uh, somebody wanted to take it from page to stage and from page to, to screen. Uh, and I think being a little older helped me deal with what might have been disappointing to a writer in the very early part of their career. Because I, I knew and I prepared myself for the fact that the story probably wouldn't survive the transition from uh, book to screen, that you have to lose something in the story. Uh, it's too complicated simply to throw it on the screen uh, and include everything that's in the novel. So those of you who read the novel and then watched the TV series might have seen that there's a lot less going on in the TV series than there is in the novel, but that's inevitable. And I think they did a great job uh, with the uh, the canvas that they were working with. Uh, the, the characters were great, the acting was terrific, they examined the themes I was trying to explore in the novel, uh, even though major sections of the story aren't represented in the, uh, in the TV series. But I was on set for uh, several days of shooting and that was a real thrill, to sit down at a picnic table and have lunch with Angus McClintock and Daniel Addison characters I've been carrying around in my brain pan for the preceding five years are now in flesh and blood in front of me. Uh, and I thought they did a, a great job with that. And the stage musical was a bit more, uh, adhered a bit more closely to the novel. Uh, and the music was wonderful, totally different experience from the TV series, but I, I loved it all. And I will never complain about uh, anybody turning my work into a, a TV series or, uh, or a stage musical. It was a, a great experience for me. Excellent. And hopefully, uh, if people didn't know it was a TV series, they can now uh, go out and try to catch that. They can, if they just go to the CBC Gem app on their laptop or their iPad, they can watch all six episodes. And, you'll, and if you look carefully and don't sneeze at the wrong time, you might see me in a cameo in the, the sixth episode, which was lots, lots of fun and unexpected, frankly. But. All right, well, there's a mission for everyone. Uh, that's, yeah, that's right. <laughs> we're all still inside. It's not quite nice enough yet uh, to go enjoy the outdoors. Uh, go see if you Correct. can. Correct. <laughs> um, there's another question that came in as well about the best laid plans. Um, they want to know, did you really slide into an enormous mass of excrement? Did you see someone else do it, or was it just your <laughs> imagination? <laughs> well, uh, it's, uh, it's not a very appetizing scene, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about. Early on in the novel, Daniel Addison, the narrator, uh, isn't watching where he's walking, and he slips in a, well, a rather uh, large pile of dog excrement. And he didn't just slip in it. He goes straight up in the air and land and kind of lands in it. And uh, I have fun describing physical comedy in, in words. So it was fun to try and 
decide how I could describe that in, in prose. Uh, and it happens, if things like that happen a few more times in the novel, but it's not there as a, as a gratuitously funny scene. It's part of, it's one of the scenes I use to establish that Daniel is a bit hapless, uh, a bit hopeless, and a bit helpless. <laughs> he's a great guy, and he's had a lot of great experience, and he's a genuinely good person, but he's not your classic hero. Uh, he, he's clumsy, he, you know, he makes mistakes, he's flawed, and that was part of establishing that character trait in him. Yeah, and uh, somebody else noted here that you are revisiting the characters from those Wow. coming up. And so the next question was, what inspired you uh, to revisit those characters? Well, I can tell you what inspired me. Um, I am, my eighth novel, which I'm just about finished the manuscript for now, is sort of a, a return to Angus and Daniel. It's not as much rooted in politics, although uh, Angus is a cabinet minister and Daniel is his chief of staff. It's almost more of a comic thriller uh in that they stumble upon the two of them stumble upon an assassination plot a plot to assassinate a world leader who is visiting ottawa uh, and nobody believes them and they end up having to kind of try to thwart this uh on their own uh, so i had some fun fun with it uh, but what inspired me is that you know having given now close to a thousand book talks since I started writing. Um, the single question I get most often, regardless of the novel I'm there to talk about, when the Q&A comes around, one of the questions is always, are we gonna hear more from Angus and Daniel? Uh, and then they'll say something like, I've read all your novels and I love them all, but nothing will ever be better than the best laid plans. <laughs> Which is not always what a writer wants to hear, that they started up here and have been going downhill <laughs> ever since. Um, but uh, people seem to connect with that novel and for that I am extremely grateful. And I just thought that given how many people have asked me and, urged, and encouraged me to, uh, to come back to them, I thought I would honor their wishes and come back with another uh, another turn for them. Uh, so I've had fun getting to know these characters uh, again, uh, and I hope that uh, I hope that people like it. The tentative title for it is Operation Angus. All right. So everyone's famous. You'll have to wait for it. You said uh, 2021, and for everyone else, if you haven't read the first two books, uh, you've got some time to catch up. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> so there's another project. Um, then a couple of other questions just kind of came in uh, towards the end here of the chat. Um, one of the questions is, what is a book from your childhood that changed your life? Ah, oh, so there's a, that's an excellent question. I remember a book, I think I was probably nine or 10 and I wasn't an avid reader uh, in my childhood. Uh, I became much more an avid reader later in life, but there was a book and it was uh, that I, I loved and I read it over and over and it was the first book that made me cry. And it was a book called Pilot Jack Knight. And it was a small book. It was thick, but it was small, uh, hardcover, and it belonged to my father. So it was a, a very old book and it was about a, uh, a young guy who just wanted to fly. And uh, the war was just ending, and he became a, a pilot instructor on biplanes. And then he became one of the first airmail pilots in the United States. And uh, it was just a great and exciting novel for a young kid to read as one of the first books he stumbles upon. And uh, a novel that you know kept me turning the pages, and it did make me cry uh, at one point. There's a a very sad scene and you probably aren't expecting to get a sad scene in a, in a book that's for for young kids but they didn't hold back and uh i thought it was pretty amazing that i could just read words on a page and they made me cry uh so that book uh sticks in my in my mind as one of the first powerful books that i ever read now, out of curiosity is that something you own or is that you know a, a library book or a camp book something uh, 
I, we did own it and I have it in a memorabilia box in the basement. So I, I still do have it. It's a little more tattered than it was then, but uh, I don't think I would throw it out. <laughs> no, always good to keep those things that uh, inspired you early on. Exactly. Um, now you also had uh, mentioned earlier in your chat about John Irving. Um, and one of the questions that came in was, uh, who is one writer, either you know, living or, or already deceased, that you wish could edit or critique your drafts? Ah, well, that's a, another great question. Well, <clears throat> I don't know if I'd want, well, I'm a huge fan of Robertson Davies. Robertson Davies was the first Canadian writer I really connected to through his work. Uh, and in fact, um, maybe I should just reach down. Um, I'm sitting at my desk in my office and this is the fo photograph that hangs uh, over my desk, sort of presiding over my writing. And it, of course, is Robertson Davies. And uh, I love his writing style. And I think he was a writer born out of his time. I think he should have been born uh, maybe in the latter part of the, of the 1800s rather than the first half of the, of the 1900s um, and, and beyond. Anyway, I, I love his writing and uh, I'm sure he could improve my writing just by casting his eye over it. Uh, so being edited by Robertson Davies would be pretty cool. <clears throat> now, um, kind of in the same theme, is there any particular author that you really enjoy reading besides uh, the two you have mentioned? Um, or do you find, you know, right now you're busy writing and don't have a lot of time for reading? Well, I, I, I am writing now. And when I am writing the manuscript, I tend not to read fiction as much. I don't know if it's a misplaced concern, but I sometimes worry that the characters I'm engaged in in the novel I'm reading will somehow seep into the prose and the story that I'm writing. Um, but before I got to writing the manuscript, um, I thought you might ask this question. I did read this book uh, recently. Um, I don't know if the text is, uh, it's called Last Impressions. I don't know if you're getting it backwards or, or not on your screen. It's Last Impressions written by a good friend of mine named Joseph Curtis, K-E-R-T-E-S. He's a former Leacock Medal winner. Uh, he started the comedy school and the school of writing at, at Humber College. He's retired now. He's a lovely guy and this novel is so good. It's powerful, it's moving, it's hilarious. Uh, and I just loved it. It has everything uh, in it. And uh, so I really enjoyed reading that. But now that I'm writing the manuscript, I tend to read a bit of nonfiction. So I've been reading Ernest Hemingway's letters. Mm. Um, particularly his letters from when he was in Paris, which is my sort of favorite era. And you might think I'm a huge Hemingway fan. I'm actually not a Hemingway fan. Uh, I don't like his, his writing particularly. I, I like to splash around in the English language. Uh, and, you know, I sort of come from the why use six words when 12 will do school of writing. And uh, that's the antithesis to how Ernest Hemingway writes. He pairs everything down and to me, robs it of the glory of the English language. <laughs> However, I've been fascinated by him for years as a literary titan who strode across the, the landscape in the last century. And just as a character, as, as a figure, uh, I've been fascinated by him. So I read a lot of biographies about him. Uh, and I'm now reading... Uh, letters by him because you think letters might be the best place for their their personality their true personality to be revealed uh, so anyway so I'm there's a couple of things that I'm, I'm reading uh, or I have read recently yes and I think letters are probably a, an excellent way to get into uh, the personal life and just yeah what what was someone like that like um, to exactly a good window <laughs> Now, in addition to the manuscript you're currently working on, um, there was a question that came in wondering if there was anything else, um, or as you've kind of referenced, do you just kind of have one idea, you're sticking with it, or do you jot down some other ideas while you're working on the current manuscript? Oh, occasionally, uh, and it's usually at this stage in the process that the idea for the next novel 
begins to take shape in my mind. And it's probably because I'm not using my story brain when I'm writing the manuscript, because the story of the novel I'm writing is already completely sorted and cooked and done. I'm just writing the words that bring it to life. So maybe there's a part of my brain that then starts turning uh, with story ideas for uh, the next book. So I, I have a couple of, uh, of thoughts on, on what might be next. I'm interested in, in the aging process. Uh, it probably has its roots in the fact that I have difficulty accepting that I just turned 60. I know Danielle and the others looking at me now, is, you find that hard to believe that I am 60, but I am. Uh, and I think I self-identify as somebody who was about 35. Uh, so I, it's possible that I might write a novel narrated by someone who is going through this strange process of feeling like I'm still in my 30s, but actually being 60. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's not a new idea. I think it's probably a, a theme that may be well-worn in the literary world. But uh, I might take a look at that. Uh, another option that came up in a, I did a, a book club Zoom call last week with a group and they were reading my third novel, Up and Down, and they wanted to read more about the characters in Up and Down. And I thought, oh, well, I wonder if I could write a second novel in with those characters and either before Up and Down or after. I, I don't know. I haven't thought, thought about it yet, but uh, so those are at least a couple of ideas that I'm kicking around, uh, but I'll need to get moving on it because I just have to keep going. I'm worried I might stop if I don't just keep going. All right, thank you. Well, we'll look forward to all those ideas. Um, I'm sure, <laughs> given what you've told us tonight, that uh, they'll make it to the page eventually. I hope so, we'll see. <laughs> all right, so that's kind of the end of the audience questions that have come in. So I'll just remind everyone that if they are looking for your books um, and they're especially looking for an ebook right now, they are available through the library. Um, and if you are having any trouble finding them, um, just reach out to the Halton Hills Public Library and we'd be happy to help people connect. Um, one of the last questions that did kind of come in though is if people are interested in following you uh, on social media, what platforms are you most active on and where can they find you? Ah, good question. I am, I think, probably most active on Facebook, and I have a personal page, Terry H. Fallis, but then I have a Terry Fallis author page uh, as well, which focuses more on my writing. Uh, I have a blog at terryfallis.com that is infrequently <laughs> updated. Uh, I'm on Twitter, uh, and I am on Instagram, though have been less active on those two. I'm more of a lurker on those, uh, on those platforms. But I, I am there. And all my social channels are, uh, you can find them on my website, terryfallis.com, if you forget uh, uh, the handles. <clears throat> all right, well, thank you very much. And uh, everyone, go head to his website and uh, find him on the platform of your choice. Thanks so much for having me, Danielle, and everyone who may be watching this. Uh, I look forward to coming back uh, to the library, Halton Hills, when, I, uh, when this is all past us and we're beyond it. But in the meantime, keep your distance, stay home if you can, wash your hands, and read Canadian novels. Yeah, so we look forward to having you um, so that we can do a proper book signing. Uh, I know that's the one thing we weren't able to recreate tonight. Uh, but we'll definitely have you back in the future and we'll definitely have uh, more questions for you then. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you very much, Terry. All right. Bye all.